one. Hi everyone and welcome to another session of Digital Twin Week. My name is Adam Beck. I'm Executive Director of the Smart Cities Council for our Australia and New Zealand region. I'm delighted to have you join us for another uh, engaging international session here. Uh, we're almost at the end, uh, one more day to go after this session, uh, but looking forward to really listening in on this evening, this afternoon's session, depending on where you're dialing in from. We're gonna talk digital twins for infrastructure. Uh, no shortage of uh, big, uh, great infrastructure projects, everything uh, digital and data in the built environment to be discussed over the next hour, hour and a half. Uh, for those of you that haven't been able to dig into the program and have a look, it's been quite extensive. You've missed a lot if you're just joining us this evening, but don't worry, uh, we have recordings for all of our sessions. Uh, and for those that are coming back for another session, uh, welcome. Uh, we do have one final session tomorrow, which is our workshop uh, helping uh, co-create a regional digital twin strategy for Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so join us for a couple of hours tomorrow, uh, network with your peers, share knowledge, and help contribute to that great uh, document that we're trying to all uh, crowdsource. Head to digitaltwinweek.com, uh, you'll be able to register for that workshop. Very much encouraging you all to use the Q questions Q&A box that you've got there on your control panel. Um, Gavin will be keeping an eye on that throughout the evening. Uh, please either direct questions to particular panelists or to the, if it's to the entire group, feel free to pop the question up there as well, or also the comments. Uh, the recording uh, will be available this time tomorrow. Um, you can head to our YouTube channel, Smart Cities Council Australia, New Zealand, or indeed uh, what I would recommend is head straight to the Digital Twin Hub uh, it'll be up there in the news section along with all of the other recordings. And while you're there, you might want to check out all of the resources that we have available, uh, articles that are up there. And of course, you can sign up and become a member and chat with uh, other members of the Digital Twin community. But as a minimum, I also encourage you to subscribe to our Digital Twin news. So head to digitaltwinhub.org for all of that Digital Twin goodness. And while we're talking about Digital Twin goodness, uh, we announced yesterday the 2021 Digital Twin Challenge. We're on the lookout for five cities, five local councils across Australia and New Zealand, and five state, territory, regional government level agency projects as well. It could be infrastructure project, an urban renewal precinct. It could be an organisation wide digital twin initiative you're looking to advance. So we're after 10 projects and organizations to work with us for a couple of years, share knowledge, build some model templates, and of course, build the lessons back and put those lessons back into uh, industry to share. Head to the hub. Uh, we've got a page set up there with a little bit of it, uh, further information. And we have a registration of interest uh, that's open uh, right now. So I encourage you to head to the hub to find out more there. Gavin will give a more detailed uh, introduction of our guests this evening. We've got uh, Rennie, Rob, Sonia, Mark, Martine and Stephen all going to be playing various roles over the next hour and a half. But with that, Gavin, let me turn the controls over to you and I'll let you take it from here as I uh, fade off into the distance uh, and I'll be coming back just a little bit later. Thanks so much, Gavin. Over to you. You're on, you're on mute, Gavin. That's all right. Thanks, Adam. Can you see my screen? Certainly can, looking good. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Adam, for the, for the intro. I'm really excited here to be today to talk to you. Um, let me just go through my slides and just stop sharing. One second. So, my, okay, can you see my screen again? Yes, we can. Okay, it's not scrolling down. Why is that? Maybe just use the arrow key. No. Nothing. It's a good start, then. We, we, we tested it four times, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, let me just come out. Okay, Adam, do you just want to just... Tap dance for a little while? Yeah, just... Uh... Sure. Well, well, why don't we do some uh, do some introductions? Let's do some self introductions. Let's start with uh, the remainder of the PCSG team. So, Rennie, do you want to go next as a uh, as an introduction? Thanks, Adam. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, Rennie Chadwick, I've uh, 
I have the pleasure of leading the PCSG team that's working with Sonia on High Speed 2. Um, and we are helping, um, helping HS2 uh, build and implement what, what's called the Visualization Hub. So uh, looking forward to sharing some of that uh, with everybody in a few minutes. Excellent. Thanks, Ronnie. Rob, let's, uh, let's uh, head to you next for an introduction. Yes, certainly, Adam. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Rob Daniel. I've been working with uh, Matt Razor and the PCSG team um, on, on our project, which we, which is called the BIF, which is which stands for Business Information Framework. We act as a uh, sort of integration environment, uh, a visualization platform for, for Harvest England, and um, I'm sure Mark will take you through through the details soon. Excellent. Uh, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Rob. Uh, Rob was there, even though you couldn't see his video. Uh, Rob, uh, Rob is is real. Uh, he yeah. he exists. Uh, and the main thing is we we have audio. Gavin, it seems like uh, yours is your your slideshow is working perfectly now. So I'll uh, I'll uh, again uh, just uh, tune off here and hand back over to you. Thanks. Well, if that wasn't uh, a perfect example of uh, virtual conferencing, I don't know what is. So uh, apologies for, for that. So look, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, this is a real opportunity today to highlight some of the, the leading work that's going on in the, in the UK uh, in terms around digital twin, around data as an asset. But also it's a real opportunity. We brought some leaders uh, within the ANZ region to talk about um, what data means how it can inform better decision making to help inform some of their strategic uh, objectives. PCSG, we're uh, originally from, from the UK. We've been operating in a digital space here for about four years. We've been helping out with a lot of governments around what does data and information mean for them. So whether we're talking about building information modeling, internet things, smart cities, and more recently digital twin, and we're starting to see owner operators start to think about that full life cycle uh, and that information. So what we're here today to talk about is um, we're going to split this into two, two parts. First one is we're going to get uh, Mark Rosa to uh, talk about smart motorways uh, program. We've got uh, Sonia we're going to talk about in terms of what HS2 are doing in the, the digital engineering space, building into a digital twin. Then we're going to park that and then we're going to have a, a Q&A session where we've got Martin Watson uh, from Sydney Water and Stephen uh, Clark from Chief Data Officer. So a real thoroughbred terms of group of people, we're gonna really challenge them in terms of what does data mean to them? What's the value of data that they're seeing? What are the strategic objectives of uh, data and, uh, and information for their respective portfolios? What do they see the challenges are, capability? So there's the sort of things we really want to have a, a strategic narrative with each of them uh, and, and, and sort of move the conversation away from a, a technical narrative into more of a strategic narrative. And I think this is where we've got a real opportunity here in this part of the world to start thinking about data as an asset. So as co-chair of the Smart Cities uh, Digital Twin uh, Task uh, Group, we really helping to build capacity and capability and we helped uh, write the Digital Twin Guidance Note. And in the interim of standards, a def definition about what a digital twin or what it isn't, everyone seems to have a view, whether you're a technology vendor, consultant, et cetera. It's really starting to, to have a first point of what a digital twin is, why a digital twin is important and how a digital twin can be applied across a life cycle. So talking to a lot of my peers this week and really good sessions all this week, fantastic. And I think what we're starting to see is really about that digital twin component and where that sort of sits in the life cycle. So on this chart here, I think the majority of the conversations that we've had are, is really around this planning CapEx world. So integrating sort of building information modeling and geospatial information. We've seen a bit with Queensland Rail, we're talking about asset maintenance, but I think what we need to start thinking about is what's the role of data? How do we treat data as much or as, as, as well as our physical assets? And uh, Mark and, uh, and Sonia will be talking a, a, a bit about that. I think also what we tend to get caught up in, in terms of as an industry, we really need to define what something is. So we've taken a bit of a, a separate approach with digital twin in terms of what is the digital twin capability. So what is the capability that you can get to support better decision making? And that's effectively what 
digital twin is about. So do you have the capability to connect data sets? Do you have from, from geospatial, from IoT, SCADA, um, Maximo, SAP, to inform better decision making? What can you do through connecting data that you can't currently do in your siloed data sets? How do you integrate? How do you make decisions by integrating different data sets? Visualizing, which we've seen a lot uh, of uh, from a geometry perspective, but how do you visualize the performance of a data set as well from, from an IoT or SCADA? Clearly as well, you've got an opportunity to analyze and simulate. What does that mean? It means the ability that you can test your asset before you actually construct it. So does that meet the policy requirements or that strategic need before you go and build a white elephant? So I think that's really important to think about capability and really be really interested to hear how you feel about what that, that capability model uh, looks like as well. So before I hand over to, to, to Rob and to, 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 to Mark, I just want to encourage you to log into the Digital Twin Hub. This is about creating a thriving marketplace. Digital Twin is not owned by any, anyone or any one person or any one sector. This is going to take multi-sector collaboration, also going to take really the, 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 the minds of academia, uh, private and, and public to, to, to work together. So I really encourage you to... Uh, to log into the Digital Twin Hub to, to, to help sort of build a thriving marketplace. So I think that's enough from me. Um, so if I can hand over then to uh, Rob and Mark, and then we're going to go straight on then to, to Sonia and Rennie, and then we're going to bring in the, uh, the, the, the panel session with the four, the four stakeholders. All right, thank you. All right, so Rob, do you want to share? So, um, yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. Good evening, everybody over there um, in the UK. It's still dark <laughs> um, and people are just about getting up. Um, my name is uh, Mark Rosa. Um, uh, as Gavin has kindly introduced, I'm the uh, PMO director for the Smart Motorways program in the UK. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the business information framework with uh, Rob's help. So maybe next slide, Rob, please. So a little bit about Highways England. Um, we, we're an owner operator of the uh, strategic road network in the UK. We've recently um, gone through our first RIS, so our first roads, full roads period, which ran from 2015 to 2020. In the top right of those slides, I just draw your attention to the kind of volume of cap, capital throughput that we've handled. Um, so we're very much a, a major project organization as well as an owner operator of the physical and digital asset itself um, in that first roads period we've delivered 6.3 billion pounds worth of um, capital enhancements and the smart motorways program formed approximately a third of that um, sort of throughput um, if you go to the next slide please to rob so during the roads first roads in uh, roads period um, smart motorways was traditionally procuring contracts through traditional contracts so we were procuring our design and construction separately then we moved into dmb contracts and then sort of two two years in we we started the journey of procuring an alliance in contract the alliance contract was going to bring three uh, construction partners two designers one production hub partner and highways england all under one umbrella um, and those parties were being procured individually, so not via joint venture or a, a group of limited companies. And what we recognized that if we were to build a business information framework, we would be able to create and enable that data and information to flow uh, more freely amongst those parties ahead of those parties coming on board. So if you just click on slightly, Gavin, uh, Rob, sorry. Um, what we recognize that if we were to build this business information framework, then hopefully our efficiency curve for those alliance partners would be accelerated because we analyzed a few other alliancing organizations. And what we found was um, it took them sort of a couple of years to break even against their traditional methods of procuring contracts. Next slide, please. Rob. 
So this is uh, quite a detailed, rich picture, and hopefully the, the slides will be shared with you all afterwards. But um, this is basically showing you the uh, the, the um, life cycle of our assets, going through the kind of um, the, uh, the design, procure, on-site assembly, and handback. Um, and in the centre, next slide, Rob, push on, please. Um, we, you show that the business information framework actually sits physically and uh, digitally in the centre of all that activity. Next slide, please. So in Highways England, um, and hopefully you'll recognise some of these challenges that we, we faced, we have many different systems, uh, both asset management, uh, we have systems that help us to sort of manage our major projects in the design and uh, project control space and the safety space. We have systems that have uh, that we use to operate and safely maintain our asset, and then of course there's a whole wealth of information and data in, uh, that sits in our supply chain organisations. We find that um, much of this information, data, and information is sort of siloed. It's difficult to gain access to, understand where it is, its context, etc. Um, and then actually bringing it all together in, in one place was going to create significant value to our alliance operating model and also pan major projects and hopefully pan uh, Highways England as a whole. Next slide, please, Rob. So what is the BIF? Um, so we've really dis described it as three co core component parts. So the information requirements, requirements that you require contractually to to build um, and operate a thing um, whether those being design information requirements or uh, actual physical handover information requirements um, it comes from multiple sources of information the second part is our integration environment where we're able to bring all that data into into one space we're able to visualize it we're also able to govern it against the information requirements that we've stipulated and the third part is about information competence, the capability to introduce that business change across that uh, program or works. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So to be able to do this, um, I, I've uh, had to go out to the market um, through competitive uh, tender. We were fortunate enough to uh, have appointed PCSG uh, in the process and they've helped me uh, and the team build a, a very comprehensive data model that enables us to bring all that data and information together. Often it's missed um, how important this part of the kind of life cycle of this type of work um, that needs to be done in, in detail and understood very clearly. And this helps us bring um, multiple sets of data into one space and to be able to network it together. Um, we've used ontologies based on industry standards um, and we've uh, also used um, subdomain models such as our work breakdown structure, cost breakdown structures for um, uh, managing significant major projects in Highways England. Next slide please Rob. So in terms of what we do in major projects, we're really only a temporary custodian of the physical and digital asset. Um, if you just click on slightly, Rob, what we do is that we take basically a slice of the, the physical asset and the digital asset, um, and we uh, change that asset and then we hand it back to the owner operator. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide again, please. So in terms of our business case for the BIF, we, we, we worked through a number of use cases. We tried to understand how producing uh, and, and developing this capability, um, where, it would, where it would save us um, uh, benefits and where it would save cashable, uh, make cashable savings on our life cycle of our major schemes. And broadly speaking, we've got um, on, on the capital, on the total works cost, we've got those kind of breakdowns of percent, percentage savings across the life cycle of a major project before we hand it back, back into operations and maintenance. Next slide, please, Rob. Um, so this is a visual in terms of all the systems that we've been able to connect to 
in Highways England, we, we've got a number of different asset management systems in the top left there. You can see we have structures, database, pavement, drainage, geotech, technology, environmental, imagery, GIS, uh, customer, health and safety, et cetera, et cetera. There are a whole host of different systems that we pull this information from. The BIF mirrors that information. It doesn't um, it doesn't disrupt the the source information. It's just mirroring it in a in a in a one um, environment space through an internet portal, and it's bringing all that data and information together. And what that enables us to do is we'll be able to make more incisive decisions, and we're also able to connect uh, connect and deliver that information to other uh, interested parties. Um, such as our rapid engineering model, for, for example, um, and the data as a service, which is a, a pan organization initiative on behalf of the uh, chief data office team. Next slide, please, Rob. So that kind of, we just whistled through um, uh, a high level overview of the, uh, the business information framework. Rob and I are going to try to attempt to show you some of this live and uh, hopefully uh, we can we can demonstrate some of this in use and, and be uh, maybe a bit of a lead in to um, our next guest speaker in terms of the HS2. So what what we're hopefully going to try and do here is um, what you can see on the right is the is a geo geo map of, of the UK. Um, we, we cut the data in a number of different ways. Um, one one way we've cut it by projects. And the other area we were able to cut it by regions. I'm not sure is this coming through, Rob, if we bring on the HS2 layer. Yeah, sorry, let me just uh, turn it on. So, so what Rob's about to do, hopefully this will come through uh, reasonably quickly and replicate on the screen okay, is um, we're able to bring publicly available information through. So what we're bringing through right now is the uh, alignment of the HS2 um, project across uh, across the UK, which um, Sonia is going to speak to you about in more detail shortly. But what we're uh, able to do here from a major projects perspective, Highways England is quite involved with this scheme. Um, if you bring through the land parcel acquisitions also, which is publicly available. Um, I don't know if you've turned that on already, Rob. Yeah. So if we zoom in, so what able what we're able to see, um, you can see that the that we're able to to overlay the land parcel acquisitions that are going to be affected for HS2, and then um, in terms of drawing information from Highways England's own asset bases, we can now switch on layers uh, such as our structures information. So if Rob goes over to the the list of information, now what you can see is we're bringing in. Um, all of our structures information that, that's been pulled from a, a, an asset database in Highways England. And you can see the density circles there, which show the number of asset uh, points within the HS2 um, boundaries and the areas where um, some of those assets may be affected by, by that significant construction project. What Rob is going to now do, I think, is highlight um, a single a single uh, structure, I think, and be able to bring through um, some of the data files that sit behind that, the data sheets, et cetera, et cetera. So if we just come back one from that, Rob, so what you can see there, sorry, is um, a whole list of all, all the asset points, all, all the data sets that sit, and it gives the designer, um, the contractor, easy access to all of that information through one one portal. The, the real power, I guess, is being able to overlay multiple different sources of information. So we can bring in flood, da flood data from the Environment Agency. So um, Rob will be able to turn on uh, flood data. So if we turn off some of that, we, we, we're now bringing in flood data from the EA. Um, we could bring in our drainage um, information from our own asset information. Um, databases and see the relationship there, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it really is as, as, as broad and as wide as you want it to, to be. Um, the real value for us as a major projects department is it, it brings all that information into one space. We can do our gap analysis really quickly. We can identify where we need to do the surveys in terms of where we might have 
missing information. Um, and it, in terms of construction, it, uh, it really helps us understand um, the, the current status of our existing assets as we go through the life cycle of, of modifying those added assets and handing them back. One of our significant use cases is the handback use case. Um, so whereby we're tracking the digital deliverables um, against the uh, against the contract and making sure that the the source systems, the asset source systems are being updated as required and that we treat the digital asset as importantly as we do the physical asset. Is there is there any more, uh, Rob, that you wanted to maybe show very briefly? I think maybe the the federated model of a, of a structure, we're able to bring that through as well. Um, do we have an example of that? It's uh, because of Zoom, the connection's a little bit choppy, if I'm honest, so. Yeah, that we'll probably leave that one. At the moment. So that, that's broadly a very high level overview. I think, I think I'll leave it there, if that's okay, Gavin. Hopefully that's um, been of interest and sort of whetted your appetite for a few further questions later on. And uh, thank you for, for letting me present this morning I'm very grateful of the opportunity. Yeah, that's thank great. you for Rob for driving. Yeah, good good job, Rob. Well, we have um, we will have some targeted questions. I'm sure from some of the questions that are coming in already. So what we will do is um, we can now hand over to the uh, the HS2 team. So Rennie and Sonia, I think Rennie, you're on mute. Okay. Renny, are you okay to share your screen? Yep, yeah, I'm just uh, clicking Brilliant. all the right buttons in the right order. <laughs> Tempting to. Well, at least you've got an excuse, Renny. It's the first thing in the morning for you. I didn't have that excuse. It's the end of the day for us. Just... Gavin, I think in... In the interest of time, I'll, I'll make a start while, oh, actually I can see the slides now. Brilliant. Thanks, Renny. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. As um, Gavin said, um, Sonia Zahiruddini, I'm the Head of Digital Engineering for HS2. Um, I've been with the business since um, 2015. I think in HS2 terms, that's a lifetime. Um, and so digital engineering and my team, we sit within one of the corporate functions. So my responsibility is to make sure that we've got a, a, a clear vision, um, a clear set of objectives um, and making sure that we've got a consistent implementation of our digital engineering approach across the program. So this covers both the phase one and phase two of the program, which I will touch on very shortly. Um, I'm going to skip the, the usual formalities and jump straight into the first slide, um, if that's okay. So just a bit of context uh, for those of you who might uh, not know a lot about HS2. So HS2 is the new uh, high speed uh, network of, um, of the UK connecting eight out of uh, 10 of Britain's largest cities. Um, as I mentioned, the, the program is made up of um, almost three phases, phase one, which starts from London to Birmingham, um, phase 2A, which is a, an accelerated part of the route and it goes from Birmingham to Crewe, and phase 2B, which is the, uh, the sort of the Y-shaped route, as you can see on the diagram, uh, going all the way up to Leeds and Manchester. So as I mentioned, we, we are part of a corporate function. So our responsibility is predominantly looking at um, across the program uh, to make sure that all the data that's being produced and um, delivered back to us is in a consistent manner. So what's our vision for digital engineering? Um, again, as you can see on the slide, um, our vision is to uh, develop a virtual railway uh, during design and construction phase of the program with a view to hand over a digital twin to um, our asset operations and maintenance. And there is a reason why we have distinguished the difference between virtual railway and uh, digital twin, which I will explain shortly. So that's our vision. Uh, why are we doing this? Um, I think there are a number of reasons for this. One of the biggest reasons is um, the, uh, lessons learned from Crossrail. We certainly don't want to repeat the same mistakes. We want to avoid uh, commissioning extensive rework and reproducing data at the end of the project. Data, uh, digital obviously is high on uh, government's agenda. 
um, we have great aspirations to uh, try and move away from, you know, document based, uh, very traditional, um, transactional ways of uh, producing and managing data to becoming more model based and data driven to um, improve decision making and make sure that we can answer complex questions. And I guess lastly, you know, HS2 is too big and it's too complex to be managed using uh, documentation and um, old ways of doing things. So um, it's fair to say that digital and uh, becoming data driven is fairly important for us. It's important for our exec. And I guess we've been lucky enough to have that senior buy-in and leadership from the start. Um, so I mentioned uh, the, uh, the difference between the virtual railway and the digital twin. Um, ultimately, the, the virtual railway is all about the, the definition and the collection of the right data to develop an abstract view of, um, of the railway as it's being planned and designed. And it's highly reliant on uh, you know, virtual design construction techniques. Um, and, and the sorts of processes and the types of technologies we use to support design and delivery will be slightly different to the types of technologies we will use to um, operate and maintain the railway. And as we are moving into, um, into the construction phase of the project, we are getting ready for uh, the collection and the management of telemetry data, real-time monitoring and performance data. And it's only when we have that live connectivity between our physical assets and our digital representations of the assets that we can easily say that, you know, we, we have managed to, to, to build or develop a digital twin. I guess we are lucky in that respect because we, we, we're not working with any legacy assets. We don't have any legacy systems. We are almost uh, starting with a blank page. As you can see on the diagram, um, there is a, a definition that um, I'm not going to read through, it's a bit of a mouthful, but um, we have defined the digital twin, there is a definition supporting it, and uh, the digital twin is very much based on um, open data and uh, being agnostic to make sure that, um, Renny, if you could um, just click once more, because I think there is a, a national digital twin, there it is. Um, th this is all to make sure that we can potentially feed into this wider industry initiative around the national digital twin and enabling smart cities. So this slide very much re-emphasizes the same points really. I think again, there is so much noise and confusion around, well, what is a digital twin? This, this is just showing that how a digital twin could mean different things at different stages of the program. Uh, and certainly for us, it's more of a gradual development and um, a progression over time to, to provide um, a, a unified view of, of the whole network. Again, um, as I said, for us, it's important to uh, not only uh, to have asset views of um, how the various types of assets are uh, uh, maturing, but it's also important to have the, the network view and that holistic view of how everything is coming together. And ensuring that these capabilities um, are uh, supporting the business needs, both for here and now, what we need to do during design and construction, and ultimately uh, what we would need to operate and maintain the railway. So we are, we are identifying use cases, we are identifying business problems that the digital twin could potentially address, uh, starting with you know, static uh, digital representations during design to support things like uh, design um, coordination, design integration, um, wider stakeholder engagement, as I mentioned during construction, uh, we'll be using uh, sensor technology, and potentially once we get into testing and commissioning, really kind of using um, um, the digital twin as that systems integration facility to, to pull together this holistic view to enable that virtual validation and verification of the railway and potentially uh, baseline that digital twin and hand it over to ops and maintenance. These are currently the services we're providing. So um, although uh, we have a, a huge uh, focus around design and engineering, that macro and micro view of the design and construction as it's being progressed, we also provide uh, a number of services um, and capabilities around surveying, um, supporting our land and property, uh, with making sure that property data and, the sub, um, and property boundaries and land parcels are uh, correctly uh, captured and managed. I think uh, Mark demonstrated an example of that earlier. Some of our environmental data, transport and logistics and so on. So although we are called digital engineering and sat within the engineering space, we do very much provide a number of other capabilities as well. So 
what are our strategic principles? So our, our strategy obviously defines the vision, it defines a set of objectives, but um, we've also identified six principles for the delivery of the strategy. Leadership, um, which is all about us being committed to being proactive in working closely with professional institutions and engaging with industry groups to ensure alignment and help shape and drive forward the, the digital engineering practices and the wider digital agenda. Upskilling, um, which is again very much about our commitments to support the improvement of the supply chain capabilities and the competencies by providing access to the right education materials um, through our upskilling platform, which many will touch on later. Future proofing, this is quite an important one. Again, as I mentioned, uh, I've touched on earlier, uh, we want to leave a digital legacy um, and we want to develop a digital twin and that could only be done through adopting uh, a software agnostic approach, making sure that the supply chain can use the best and most appropriate tools for the job, really promoting principles of open data standards to enable interoperability, both at a data level and a technology level. Um, very quickly, standardization and connectivity. That's all about consistency of information flows and shifting from silo processes to a more integrated and streamlined end-to-end -end, um, processes and kind of moving away also from desktop-based applications to um, cloud-based and service-based models. Once we do that, then we can, I think it's fair to say that uh, we can um, integrate and automate um, um, where appropriate to, to reduce reliance on highly manual tasks. And lastly, security, resilience and ethics, which is all about making sure that the the technology and the data elements of our digital twin are safe from cyber attacks and more importantly ensure that the digital network is resilient and um, that once we get into the world of big data and AI which I'm sure we will get um, as, as uh, during this project and um, that there are no um, wrong conducts or um, unethical use of data. So um, this slide is very much a holistic simplified view of um, our end-to-end -end approach um, at the top as you can see that this uh, we've got the strategy and the vision so the strategy that informs a set of requirements that are embedded into the contracts uh, you can see on the left hand side the implementation plan um, so uh, that's very much setting out our key digital engineering processes that we and the supply chain must follow to ensure compliance with our requirements um, on the right hand side, you've got the assurance plan, which is very much setting out an end to end assurance process to making to, to, to make sure that the, the right things are being um, enabled and embedded at the right time and that they are delivering the intended outcomes that will maximize the benefits of employing a digital engineering approach. And at the middle, the, the, the program itself is, the, is almost an internal facing um, portfolio of activities, so all the capabilities that we must uh, uh, provide for the business and, and they are underpinned by four key enablers, which are um, again typical party model process organization technology and data, all underpinned by a benefit realization framework. Um, Ray, if you click once more, just um, I wanted just to very quickly touch on um, our capability model as well. So the, the program obviously is underpinned by digital twin capability model, um, very much again around the party. Um, so, you know, looking at uh, what, what sort of um, new capabilities we need to introduce around governance, uh, looking at business process engineering, what um, new capabilities or enhanced capabilities we need to have around data, technology and integration and, and the wider organizational change and so on. Um, I, I mentioned uh, benefits realization, just very quickly touching on this. Um, so back in 2013, um, there was an efficiency challenge set by the Department for Transport. Um, um, and we were asked to demonstrate uh, the cost savings through the use of BIM. And since then, we've gone through a, a massive um, and extensive benefits mapping exercise, uh, trying to understand um, you know, what sort of benefits we can realize. And as you can see on the screen, uh, the, the benefits are grouped by performance, cost, time, environment, safety, regulation, and reputation. What, what then we did, we um, kind of looked at some of those benefits. Uh, Ren, if you could jump to the next slide, please. 
uh, we looked at those benefits and we looked at how we could map those against our HS2's strategic objectives and start to work backwards to understand what sort of capabilities we need to provide within the HS2 organization and what capabilities uh, need to be provided by our supply chain. Again, recognizing that we're not a design house and a lot of the, the production and the management of the design happens in, in, our, um, in our supply chain. Um, Renny, if you click once more, um, I think um, I just wanted to very quickly touch on the fact that um, although these capabilities are contractualized and defined, uh, we also have developed a, a maturity assessment or a capability assessment, um, which we use to uh, monitor the performance of, of the contractors. And apologies, I, I recognize these diagrams are fairly blurry, um, but just to, to kind of um, cover some of the confidential data in there. And this is my last slide on benefits. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have objectives and we have mapped all of our objectives to the benefits we have identified. In turn, we have developed a number of KPIs. These, these are all being cascaded down through um, our various contracts. And uh, we have also developed a reporting dashboard to make sure there is a level of consistency around um, reporting of some of these cost savings that are, we are actually the, the contractors are starting to, to report on them, which, which is very refreshing to see. So in terms of practical implementation of our data capabilities, um, of, again, um, as a, a client authority, we are responsible for setting data standards and specifications. And as you can see on the slide, uh, the way we've approached this um, is to focus on the sort of the non-graphical aspect of the assets. What, what are the sort of um, data attributes we would need to collect about the assets? Um, the, um, the graphical representation of the assets. So, um, you know, all the information that would represent uh, the asset in the 3D view, um, all of the geospatial uh, and the location aspect of the asset and documentation and, and the whole sort of federated or what we call the information model is a collective of all of these various data types and they're all um, wrapped um, by um, almost like an information package uh, which enables that um, structured and consistent way of um, um, kind of uh, all of these various elements are to, to, to be put together and delivered back to us. Um, Mark mentioned ontology earlier as well, so we have also tried to adopt a very similar approach. Um, so we are kind of trying to move away from flat and in some cases single hierarchies to an ontology based approach to put a more logical, flexible and consistent semantic model behind um, some of these hierarchy, hierarchical views um, so that we can easily combine uh, or slice and dice for reporting purposes. Again, this is more of a legacy and a cultural issue where you have um, a, a massive um, divide and almost an isolation between engineering, project management and commercial functions. Um, um, the, the way that these data structures are defined are very much driven by WBS structures, cost breakdown structures or asset breakdown structures. And what we have noticed is that um, uh, we need to move away from that if, if we were to um, enable in interoperability. And this way you, you get the data sets that are um, relatable, kind of related to one another and get this by the web view of the whole network. And this is very much aligned um, to the semantic web concept. So where data becomes um, machine readable and it's no longer locked in, in PDFs and immutable formats, which can't be reused. Oh, this was the spider web diagram that I was talking about, but it's fine, Renny, we can move on, I'm conscious of time. The, the other thing we've done, uh, we've also tried to establish uh, a data quality framework. Um, this is uh, very much in line with ISO 8000, uh, which introduces processes and checks, uh, but very specific to uh, CAD, GIS and asset information domains, um, and um, kind of addresses both the content and the metadata uh, so um, this is very important for us. We, we are seeing poor quality data from our contractors. So we've spent a lot of time making sure that there is a, a robust and a consistent um, data quality framework, which we are now turning into a specification for a, a data ingestion platform. I think you'll be glad to know this is my last slide before I hand over to Renny. Um, very quickly on being software agnostic. Renny, if you could move on to the next slide, please. 
Thank you. Um, so uh, being software agnostic and uh, uh, neutral, uh, what does that actually mean? Um, because we want to future proof and we want to provide flexibility for our supply chain, we have not mandated or specified uh, the use of any, any specific software, design authoring tools or, um, or any, other soft, um, any other systems. Instead, what we've done, we've specified data formats and we are relying on uh, open data formats such as IFC. We recently commissioned a piece of study to look at the use of IFC. And while we recognize there are still some gaps around uh, certainly IFC for rail and um, some of the linear assets, uh, we are working with Building Smart and more recently um, Shift to Rail, which is a European led initiative to ensure that these gaps are filled and working with our software providers where we can to ensure that the latest IFC schemas are compatible and implemented in, in their respective tools. On that note, um, Renny, I'm going to hand over to you to finish this off. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Um... So it's maybe um, useful at this point just to, to reflect back to where, where Sonia started talking about the, uh, the, the scale and uh, complexity of high speed too. Um, it's, it's not only large, it also exists over a, a, a long period of time. Um, uh, and as Sonia said, she's, she's been with the project since 2015. Um, the design uh, and construction phase has really just got going um, for phase one. And the purpose of this slide really is to give you some uh, some context on that. So, so when the um, when the project starts off, a phase of the project starts off, it's uh, it's going through a uh, a legal process. It's got to be enacted by a bill um, in in Parliament, and in that phase of the project, um, the, uh, the the working arrangement in in terms of generating design information, creating the design is is as shown on the left hand side here. It's a centralised approach. Um, High speed two at that stage is acting as the as the principal designer, and uh, and is and is tightly controlling uh, as a consequence, or is completely in control of how the information is uh, is is authored, generated, saved, and shared. And to give you an idea, in phase one, that that's generated sixty terabytes of data uh, in that phase. For phase one, we're now in the uh, in the design and build, the, the delivery phase. Um, so high speed two now is acting more as a, an integrator the the responsibility for undertaking the design um, and starting to generate the information that, that flows through with that on on how that design uh, is, is constructed into physical assets is handed over into supply chain um, and as sonia said that's a, a a technology agnostic approach it's not um the 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 the, the, the software is not mandated it's the data that high speed to want that is uh, that forms part of the specification. And to give you some idea of um, uh, again scale at, at, at the end of, uh, of phase one, we expect to have something like 800 million assets uh, with an associated 5 billion attributes. So it's a it's a fairly large undertaking. So what I'm going to show show you now is uh, is, is a little bit of um, the uh the the platform that we've been building the visualization hub we've been building with uh with high speed two um just get the right uh the right kind of view up and i'll pull that across and i'm sitting here with fingers crossed that uh what quite often happens on demos uh, doesn't happen in that the technology falls over or goes a little bit slower than normal. So what we've got here is this this is the, the, the home page for the visualization hub. And the principle here is that we are, um, sorry, I'm very sorry, I've skipped a slide. Sorry, the principle I'm about to show you is, is illustrating what, what this slide is talking about. So. What we're trying to do here is, is uh, through one platform, uh, provide everybody in, in High Speed 2 with the ability to see all of the data uh, they need to, to, to do their job, to, to make the decisions they need to do. Um, and, uh, and as Sonia said, it's, it, it's uh, an approach where we're, we're taking to combine all, all kinds of, uh, of, of data, whether that's asset data, documentation, geospatial 
uh, simulation uh, design models and so on. So this, uh, this little graphic in the top right is, is an overview of what that, what that uh, system looks like in terms of a, a, a logical design at a very high level. So over here we've got um, we've got all the supply chain with uh, with their respective uh, connected and common data environments. They're generating information. They pass across into uh, source systems that um, are operated by High Speed Two uh, that look after different domains. So we've got models, uh, we've got documentation, we've got an asset information management system, and a whole load of GIS data and and many other. Uh, sources of data uh, relating to uh, project controls and so on. And what we're doing with the Visualization Hub, this, this nice uh, magenta box over here, is, is integrating that data and then representing it back to uh, anyone that has the, uh, the, the permissions to see it uh, in a format that they can then they can use to, to base their decision making on. So back to that. Uh, back to that demo. So this is um, uh, this is the, the way into uh, to look at that data. Um, <clears throat> key thing to start with is that um, that a user can can find what they're looking for uh, in in all that integrated data set. Um, so we we have a, a a number of routes in. You can you can drive dive straight down into the map. You can search by uh, by um, the name of an asset or, or the or the name of a section, um, or you can you can start by by looking at um, uh, asset types or actually just types of data. So we've got all of the assurance data in here. Uh, maybe click to a different view just to give you something a bit more material to look at. So, if for instance we wanted to to, to understand what's going on better at Euston Station, um, we we can drill down to uh, to, to use the station as a as an asset. We get a little map view here that which shows us the extent of the work, uh, an overview of anything to do with with in incidents or, uh, or or assurance data. We can drill down to the sub assets that make up uh, the uh, Houston station in the work breakdown structure, and we can drill straight down into uh, all the associated models and documentation. Um, the, the other key thing that um, we're we're keen to be able to do is to is to look at uh, is to look at the those assets in in, in their context. So this is uh, the the virtual railway representation. Um, and what you can see here is a a, a view looking at um, at Euston Station, the Euston Station end of the uh, end, end of the line. And we can we can use this view. I'm not going to do this on on the demo because it uh, I'll get carried away and will take too long. But we can fly up and down the route, um, and we can we can dive down into into detail at any point we want to uh, to to understand um, the, uh, the the assets in their context, and and then from this we can link back if we want to in, into all of that data we were looking at on on this view here. So that's um, that's a really quick um, overview of the of the way that we've we've been bringing that data so we can integrate it, present it in a way that people can uh, can visualize the data, uh, do that in a way that's useful to them, and, and then also start to analyze what that means when they look at uh, the, the data and the asset in the context. So if I switch back to um, if I switch back to the the, the slides, it's just a couple of um, couple of slides to finish off. So one of the uh, really important points that, uh, that that Sonia mentioned earlier on, um, and uh, and when we get excited about the technology, we quite often forget is that the people dimension. Um, we can build all the technology uh, we like, we can build it into all the processes we like, but if we don't develop the capability of the people to, to use that technology uh, effectively and undertaking their roles, then uh, we, we really restrict the rate of progress we can make. So this is um, uh, a bit of an advert really for, um, for what we're doing with, with High Speed 2. This is the, 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 the BIM upskilling um, uh, platform. This uh, this is this is very new, uh, only launched yesterday, 
And this is available to everybody, not, not just in high speed two, but uh, but more widely. And um, so, it's, so it's effectively got public access. I think, um, Sonia, if, uh, uh, if, if people are interested, we can share the details on that after uh, this part of the, the, the follow on from, uh, from this session. But uh, we, we just wanted to, to, to make sure we included this aspect because it's a really important um, factor in, uh, in, in realizing all those benefits that, that Sonia was describing a few moments ago. And uh, that's the uh, that's the that's the conclusion of the of the high speed two session. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, really appreciate that, uh, the Renny and Sonia. Really, really interesting there. So, what I'd like to do now is to bring in our panelists. So, if um, we can ask Sonia, Mark, Martin, and Stephen to to join. If you put your cameras on, that would be that would be great. Okay, there's really a lot of interesting um, questions coming in, but I think, Stephen, I'd like to put first question to you, really, in terms of obviously your role as Chief Data Officer for the, um, the New Zealand Transport Agency. What, is, what does data as an asset mean, mean to you? Really keen to get your thoughts on that, please. Um. I guess it has a number of different meanings in different contexts. I mean, first of all, in order to be recognised as an asset, it has to be on the bottom line at some level. Um, it has to be considered a contractual deliverable, it has to have quality expectations around it and not be seen as something that is a, a kind of um, a wash up at the end of a project and all the money's gone and it's too late to affect the quality. So I think um, when you think about data as an asset, you think about it in the same terms as you would think about with your infrastructure assets. It must be delivered in a timely fashion. It must be maintained. It must be looked after in context. Quality expectations must be um, set, agreed to, and met. And it has to have ongoing value. So if your business doesn't recognize it um, as an asset and isn't seeking the, um, ongoing deliverables and benefits from it, it's never really going to be recognized as an asset and as I say, in the same way as you've got infrastructure, it has to have a long tail of value. And for me, um, it's, it's as with any asset, it's, it's not always the intrinsic value of it. It's what you can do with it and what it enables you to do. And I think being able to make that next leap up to digital engineering for transport um, and BIM onto digital twins is one of the key aspects of, of using data uh, as, a, as an asset. But it's, it's that next level again of insight and analytics, predictive analytics, being able to shape business decisions at the big macro and strategic level um, and, you know, making your mistakes before you actually start putting shovels in the ground. No, absolutely. So where do you think New Zealand Transport Agency are at is seeing that value, that strategic value? Are they seeing that, that they're, they're putting that on the balance sheet or is that a, a progressive journey at the moment? Well, I'd say it's a progressive journey. We're in a, a situation post-COVID that um, the government's putting in the best part of ten billion into the um, into the transport uh, infrastructure sector to stimulate the economy. And you know, for a country of five million people, that's that's a pr pretty big chunk of money. It's the biggest um, spend by the government since the Second World War. So what we are saying is that one of the key deliverables, even if you accept only one percent of that spend, for example, was spent on uh, data. Um, then you know you're talking you're still talking about hundreds of millions of dollars and from that you would expect clarity of deliverables clarity of expectations and benefit um, port and the benefit portfolio will be really explicit and tracked and for me that's um, that's been quite a difficult message to put across because it's often salami sliced across lots of different sub projects of different um, contracts and trying to raise it back up into that strategic level, so it's a big enough envelope of money to get the uh, to get recognised as a digital asset with that ongoing value is tricky. But um, when you start to have the big numbers that I've just talked about, then it's inescapable. Yeah, no, no, brilliant. So, Mark, I want to bring you into that in terms of this data as an asset. We we hear about Highways England's view of data as a strategic asset. Keen to sort of understand your your own journey in terms of. Has there been a business case development in terms of understanding with the BIF before you've obviously you've got this 
great platform in terms of where you're able to integrate, visualize and connect different data sets. Has, has there been a, a business case development to, to get that strategic buy-in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you hear me okay? Is that okay? Yeah, all good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, it's quite, we've been on quite a significant journey, I guess, in Highways England. Um, the, the business case for the BIF started probably um, sort of three, three to three and a half years ago. Um, we've developed it from a concept into an outline business case and full business case and, and, and had to go through the Green Book. A five point treasury green book exercise in terms of governance right the way up to um, government digital services sign off by uh, dft and, and treasury to to get that sponsorship um where where we we've really been maturing we've been on a maturing journey because since that early concept idea of the biff business case um the 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 organization has recognized the need for uh digital and data and actually we've we've um, in that time we've hired our chief data officer um, we've then subsequently employed people within his team that have uh, uh, specific digital and data expertise so whilst we were on the journey of trying to build the BIF um, this new this new capability was coming into the organization which has really helped us um, support the concept but has also brought the, uh, the wider understanding of data as value right corporately, right across the organization. So now whilst we were doing kind of BIF in smart motorways and on behalf of major projects, making sure that it was um, extendable and scalable across major projects, we've also now got the organization developing its capability in, in this data space. And we are a big, we're a big contributor now to helping develop and mature that. So um, I'm not sure that answered your question, but um, it, it's kind of moving, moving um, maturity programs within a, a, an organization. And we've had to make sure that we stayed mate, aligned. Yeah, so I think what I'm keen to understand and we'll bring Sonia uh, and Martin to this point as well is typically here in this part of the world, digital data initiatives are quite siloed. They're very much in a, a ring fence from a, a project perspective and the digital um, narrative is really a, more of a technical management engagement within clients and owner operators. Really clean to, to understand how you sort of got into that strategic buy-in. So I understand you have a, a top-down approach as opposed to a, a bottom-middle approach. So how, how did you make that, 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 that transition? So the strategic buy-in took, took a lot of hard effort. To be quite honest, it, it took a lot of engagement, a lot of discussion, a lot of... Um, uh, talking through senior leaders around the concept. Um, part of that buy-in was, was, was uh, achieved by our governance process. So our governance process very much means that when we have a business case and we're seeking funding to do an initiative, we have to get um, approvals for certain levels of executives in the organization. So for example, from my perspective, I had to get business case approval, not only from my major projects exec director, it also had to go to the CEO, to Jim O'Sullivan and his exec. And in terms of congruence, it also had to get IT, ITD, our, our IT directorate's um, governance approval as well. So in parallel, um, both departments and also the executive director had to sign off um, the, the business case. And, and to do that, we had to do a lot of stakeholder engagement prior to taking those business case for approval. So there's almost the formal part and then the informal part where we're having presentations, we're having conversations. But we do recognize in major projects that um, to become more efficient across our safety customer delivery imperatives, we have to become more digitally minded. And Peter Mumford, our exec director, has specifically targeted um, what we're calling digital by default as an initiative across the whole of major projects to drive uh, digital improvement um, initiatives. So that's really highlighting and bringing to the fore um, all digital initiatives into uh, an exec sponsorship environment. Yeah, that's critical, obviously, for paying sponsorship and, and funding to, to do these packages. So Sonia, really keen to get your, your perspective on that and getting 
how have you managed to get that to the top down approach within within H2? Has that been a similar journey around business case development or winning hearts and minds for for HS2? Um, I think it's fair to say we've been lucky in that respect because, uh, you know, I think since day one, ever since I joined the business, we've always had that exec sponsorship and they've been championing, you know, the digital approach, data and BIM. Um, I'm going to use a, an analogy that Professor Andrew McNaughton, who at the time was our technical director, used to use to describe BIM and data for HS2. He used to say, you know, data or BIM is the lifeblood of HS2. I think they recognised from day one that this is important. We have to do this. We can't manage the project without it. And I think given that, I uh, completely agree with Stephen's point, and I think given that we are highly reliant on our contractors, um, we, don't, we don't do design, we just rely on data. That's how ultimately we make decisions. So for us to actually treat data as an asset and get that sponsorship and buying is quite key to be able to draw insight and um, actually inform, inform decision-making. So yeah, that support has always been there from day one. <laughs> so why do you think you've been lucky then? Is it just down to your lack of who's who's come onto the project or do you think it's the maturity of the, the, the UK market in terms of what or all of the above? I think it's definitely the latter. I think certainly the, the thinking is changing. I think definitely the, the maturity has changed. And actually, I think there is an element of lessons learned coming out of Crossrail. Um, I think um, they've, they've done a sterling job in, in communicating the importance of data and, and how it's having huge impacts and it's materializing and manifesting in, in terms of cost and delays to the program. And um, yes, I think definitely the maturity is in the UK. Certainly, I've, I've, I've seen a massive shift since um, I joined the project. Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's, that's really good. Okay, Martine, it'd be good to bring you in. So what we've talked about digital twin sort of coming across that sort of full life cycle, connecting CapEx and, uh, and OpEx. From your perspective, where do you see in terms of what the challenges are for implementing digital twin across Sydney Water? Where would you see the, the real challenges you think in terms of bringing that cross departmental approach to, to, to data. Yeah, sorry, Gavin, you were breaking up. I, I missed what uh, the, the question there. Um, were you asking how we bring the, um, uh, the how we get uh, interaction across departments? Yeah, look, it's, it's really about in terms of digital twin, uh, sort of it's a horizontal skewer across the organization through like capital delivery, OPEX, customer service delivery. What do you think are sort of the big sort of challenges for a, a, a sort of a water utility company like Sydney Water in bringing together sort of those departments together to, 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 to enable that digital twin? What do you see as sort of the, the, the main challenges? Do you see them as commercial, um, security, governance, buy-in? Well, what, where do you see the sort of the main challenges um, sort of a getting, getting digital twin off the ground? I, I think you probably touched on uh, on all of the challenges, uh, or I think all of the things that you called out can can present challenges. Um, the the real question is is that we have to ask ourselves is why, um, and recognizing uh, what it is that we're actually trying to achieve, and and really starting with um, the requirements. We've I guess the approach we're taking towards um, what it is that that we want to build and the ecosystem that we build is is um, future casting to that um, uh, that desirable state uh, where we want to be in, in sort of 10 years time. Um, and then from that reverse engineering back uh, a roadmap that really covers off on looking at what about what our enablers are, um, what our initiatives are that we um, need to undertake to be able to uh, deliver us towards that. And what is the capability that we need to acquire on that journey as well? Um, from that skeleton, we can identify uh, the value chain across the organization um, to identify the, uh, the business areas that will be impacted, um, bring them in in a matrix style, I guess, uh, project to be able to ensure that we are what we are building as far as the technology goes meets the, the business's requirements and ultimately meets the, the customer's requirements. Um, the benefits can also be defined from looking at that, I guess, that uh, journey um, and recognising that 
some of the benefits are going to be similar to what Stephen talked about. Um, it's, it's avoided costs as well as savings and then increases improvements in, in performance uh, and capability as well. Um, so the many challenges in that, when you start to talk about hyper-connectivity of, of systems, hyper-connectivity of data, um, uh, close or, or tight coupling across areas of the organization that typically haven't been coupled, um, you can get language barriers, you can get um, you know, privacy concerns with data, you can get architecture concerns, um, being able to connect across dissimilar functional areas as well. So translating uh, the ability to translate the messages that you're trying to communicate, the ability to uh, connect data that is dissimilar, the ability to connect systems that are dissimilar, all present uh, these wicked problems, I guess, that, that keep us very occupied and very busy. Um, the, the thing that I've noticed the most uh, with any type of transformation like this is the amount of it's a very different project to be running. It, it really is. It's a, a long-term digital transformation as opposed to uh, data transformation or uh, technology transformation. It, it really is changing the capability of an organization and the way we do things. And that requires us uh, to think very, very differently um, and structure the project resources very differently. Um, and to report on the benefits very differently than what we have in a typical waterfall project. Oh, that's great, my team. So what I'd like to ask is, is that the, the, the panel is, uh, perhaps Stephen, if you could to build up in your perspective as well, is what's your view on standards in terms of procuring and, and managing the data? Does it hinder uh, innovation? Does it help improve capacity and capability? Does it help set the rules for your, for your supply chain to, to, to meet. Keen, keen seem to, to get your, your input on onto standards, please. Well, I think standards are absolutely critical. Um, I, I mean, I often give the example of, of the internet. The internet only works because it has ruthlessly strict standards. Um, you can use the internet in any device in any country on the planet um, uh, and get the same experience. And that's because it has incredibly strict standards and no one would say the internet stifled innovation. What standards allow you to do is to have, is to have common currency, common language, common concepts and common approaches to the data that allow you to bring that together to get much greater insight across the different data sets and uh, consistency between the data sets to be able to not only visualize your, your assets, um, but to be able to do that predictive analytics uh, uh, and understanding uh, your environment in the round, not just from the asset maintenance perspective, but from the financial perspective to the um, safety perspective, to the resilience perspective, but using the same data sets instead of duplicating data over and over again, because you can't munge it together to be able to get the outcomes that, that you require. And I was really heartened to see HS2 using um, ontological models, because I've got to say that is a generational barrier. We've been putting in the asset management data standards as our, as our key foundation for how we want to see data models um, set up. And it's an, act, an actor-based model, so it, it, it's designed in order to be process-driven, but also to drive processes. Um, and so you can put the data validation routines into the standard itself and even build an algorithm so you're getting direct value by just putting the data into the, the model on top of the, those consistency um, the returns on investment that you get. Um, so when, when in New Zealand, I'd say we are not as advanced as, as other jurisdictions, particularly in, in Europe uh, around BIM, but we've, we've learned from what we've seen in other jurisdictions that BIM has been great in, in moving up to level four and, and beyond, but without that common data model, you don't genuinely get those common data environments which you're really seeking to get. Um, and you certainly don't get them across the different phases of the asset life cycle. There's still that barrier between design, um, construct, um, as built and, and into the maintenance part. And then, you know, the maintenance part is where you do the 90% of, uh, uh, deal with the 90% of the life of the asset but typically with only 10% of the spend, 90% is spent in the first five or 10 years of an asset's 
life um, through that build and construct phase. So if we don't put, if we don't put those um, standards at the beginning to give us the, uh, the commonality of approach to be able to manage those assets long term, we'll never really get it in because the, the, the money's gone and the impetus is gone. And it's, it's why we have to set clear expectations with our third party contractors and, and suppliers that there's clear expectations and just the same way as we set standards for aggregate or, or pavement or um, lighting or any other of those things that we set standards for, it should be an accepted and perfectly reasonable approach to say, here's the, here's the data and the quality expectations that we expect on you to apply, that you to apply to your data models and the quality, um, the consistency and the relationality of the data sets and data models that you're, you're sharing back with us to reflect our expenditure with you. Yeah, okay. So I'll pick up one of the words, quality and, and, and value. What I'm keen to, to ask both Mark and Sonia is, you've implemented, you've created business cases, you're implementing this. How are you, how are you demonstrating value back to the exec? How, how are you demonstrating that what you are doing is providing value? So King, probably Mark, if I go to you, you first, if, if you've got a mechanism in terms of how you're, you're demonstrating value by adopting a data-driven approach? Yeah, so I think it's, it's a fair question. Um, we, we, in the business case, we had to identify all the key benefits of doing that initiative. Um, and those are you know, specifically measurable um, benefits that we have to track throughout the life cycle of that business case. Um, but it's fair to say, actually creating the, the benchmark to measure from is quite a challenge, particularly when, um, particularly when everything is quite fluid as well. So, um, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's a moving feast. But, um, you know, in terms of the simple answer to your question, Gavin, it's, it's yes. Um, it's based on our benefits cases within the business case. And each of those benefits has to be measured throughout the life cycle of um, the BIF. Um, and more and more broadly so uh, okay great and it's 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 through our benefits realization plan of of the business case okay and Sonia is the same thing same question for you is how you've been sort of uh, measured in terms of uh, the the success of, of, of the, the HS2 program have you got some insights so in? yeah I think as I alluded uh, during my presentation again very similar to HE's approach we we have developed a, a very robust and comprehensive benefits realization framework as well but I think as just building on Mark's point there um, one of the things that we are finding is that currently there is no benchmark so it's very difficult to to have something to compare to say well actually this because there is always an upfront investment with digital and and digital transformation um, so it is very difficult and although we are uh, we have set all of these KPIs, we have uh, reporting dashboards, and we are trying to monitor uh, the uh, the quantifiable ben benefits. Well, actually, funnily enough, we, we've tried to um, adopt two approaches. One is almost through storytelling, where uh, some of the benefits are very qualitative and are very difficult to measure. So we try and tell those stories through um, case studies. But where we can quantify uh, benefits, then we, that's how we kind of report them back to the exec. And I think there are, for us at least, there are two aspects to our benefits realization framework. One is, which is very much contractor facing around all the, the KPIs, um, the, the commercial KPIs and the contractual objectives that we've set them. Uh, but we've also got internal KPIs through the internal capabilities that we are providing within HS2. But as I said, I think, yeah, just, just not having a clear industry benchmark is, it makes it very difficult to demonstrate that value prop um, proposition at times. Yeah, so that's, that's great. So, so back to Martin, do you think that's one of the main challenges from Sydney Waters is to demonstrate value and, and, and benefit of what Digital Twin could mean to, to Sydney Water? No, I, I think um, we we understand what, what the benefits are and, and we need to um, uh, map that out. I think it, it's more we're just uh, building that framework at the moment. Um, so we're at the, I guess, the beginning of the journey um, towards defining that. I don't see it as being a roadblock or a challenge. I just think it, it is still a work in progress at this point in time. Yeah, okay. So before we sort of uh, conscious, we've only got probably about six or seven minutes. So 
I'm going to ask each of you in terms of a question, um, maybe Stephen first. What do you think is the, the biggest risk in developing and implementing a, a, a data program into a transport agency such as New Zealand? The biggest risk to being successful is it not being driven by the business. It has to be driven by the business and, and seen as something that they require in order for, for them to be for them to be successful. Um, because data and information should not my team, we do very little for, for ourselves. Our job is to deliver services to the rest of the organization. And if, if those services are um, purely pushed by us, they'll never be fully accepted. There has to be that pull um, and we need to be pulled in to projects and seen as being key partners. So um, for, for digital to be successful, it has to be seen as um, a, a derived direct benefit of infrastructure spend and something that's demanded by the business to, uh, to undertake its job um, and to show that it is successful and uh, to allow it to be successful in what it does throughout the entire life cycle of the physical asset base. Um, and so I think it has to be recognized as being intrinsic. That I don't think we can, we can continue to think of, of infrastructure as being mere, merely or purely a physical artifact. It has to be seen as being a, high, a hybrid out, outcome and output, both physical and digital, because the digital twins, what we use to manage the physical environment, to get the benefit from it, um, to maintain it, and to um, to manage and uh, implement the things that we need around safety, resilience, and um, and public trust and and our uh, infrastructure spend. So there's you know there's, there's beyond the initial ripple of of the customer base within our own organisation and out within the, the broader sector of, of suppliers, contractors, and, and, the, and the doers. And ultimately, um, in the infrastructure space, it's, it's, it's public money. Um, so we have to be able to show benefits right, um, right from end to end. But, I, I would, but to round right back on your question again, if it's not driven by the business, for the business, with the business, for those long-term outcomes and seen as a strategic asset and a generational one at that with your executive, for them to be successful and something that, that, that your board is digitally savvy enough to expect your executive to deliver, you've got to line up all those different things. Otherwise, it just becomes seen as a, as a nice to have or, a, or an overhead at worst. Yeah, spot on, spot on. So, Sonia, if I can put that question back to you, what's, what do you, what do you think the, the, the biggest risk you think in terms of implementing, if you move from that virtual railway to a digital twin, what do you see as sort of the biggest risk moving forward? Um, I think for me, I know we touched on this earlier as well, but certainly lack of visible exec buying to, to drive that culture change and to, to tr drive the change that's needed top down. Because um, obviously within HS2, we've got loads of great people tech savvy all trying to kind of, you know, try and implement this bottom up. And if we didn't have that top down sponsorship, I think it would have definitely made things more difficult. The, the other risk is um, lack of clarity on business needs and the use cases. Um, I think, and the ex and managing expectations, stakeholder expectations, you know, thinking you could have one super duper digital twin that could meet all the business um, problems. Um, and again, back to my earlier slides where it, it, you, we've got to make sure that people understand that there are different uses or use cases around a digital twin. Uh, you could have asset level digital twins, you can have multiple digital twins, you can have an ecosystem of digital twins. So I think the biggest risk for me is that lack of understanding of it, uh, being clear on the use cases um, and how you expect the end users to interact with it uh, to, um, I guess, try and answer business problems. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Mark, if you're able to sort of build on that from, from your perspective, please. Yeah, I think I think all of those ring true. I think the biggest challenge um, we've had was alignment, so cross directorate alignment. Um, so, uh, you know, in an organisation that's three and a half thousand strong, um, when you're when you're going on a digital initiative um, such as we were or have been and still are, the the initiative is kind of cross directorate 
because the assets, you know, it, we, we in major projects are only there temporarily. It then moves into operation and maintenance. Obviously, there's a load of IT um, that's, that wraps around that in terms of the IT directorate, that's security, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so almost impact on every part of our directorate, um, safety engineering standards directorate, um, et cetera. So, so getting cross directorate alignment is, is a key risk when you set up, set up and, and set out on one of these digital transformation uh, projects or programs and making sure that you have that alignment and buy in from, from each of those directorates and, and almost participation. So, so what we did is we, we set up a, what we call a steering committee um, and we, we invited and, and asked people from those key directorates to attend and participate and feel like they're actually contributing to the solution to tackle uh, that cost, cost directorate alignment issue. Yeah, okay, so get, get in that hearts and minds that was critical with the, the, the executive mark. So yeah, great. Thanks for that. So Martine, I'll ask you this, the same question. Obviously, yeah. obviously sitting water in a, a slightly different uh, part of the journey compared to HS2 and uh, and to Highways England. Keen to see what where you see sort of the big risk. Yeah, um, it's a good question, Gavin. And, and for me, I guess uh, I see the biggest risk not so much in being getting the executive sponsorship or, or being able to, to build the digital twin, but if we fail to roll out um, proper governance around data and, and treat the data as an asset, um, then, then we risk building something that either people don't trust or they, they do trust it and they make the wrong decisions with it. So for me, getting that the data governance, getting the strategy around our data uh, so that the the twin can become trusted and, and add value is the most important. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, well, well, thank you all very much for your really insightful uh, views. Ad Adam, I know you like to run a, a really tight ship and uh, you want a couple of minutes to, 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 to end up. And uh, do I hand back over to you, Adam? Yeah, Gavin, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, and indeed, to the entire panel. Um, I've been frantically taking notes here on all my cards. There's been some great um, uh, great insights that have been shared and, and also some really thoughtful questions coming through from the audience. Um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Gavin and the, and, and the PCSG team, um, Sonia, Mark, Martin, Stephen as our guests. Thank you uh, very much for coming on and sharing your thoughts. Um, Digital Twin Week has, has been an evolving discussion with our community over here and getting uh, some of those international uh, and also national perspectives has been uh, invaluable. Just a couple of final uh, notes, as I mentioned, um, this session now uh, pretty much almost has us there at the end of the week. We've got one more session remaining, which is our workshop tomorrow. So any uh, sort of Australian, New Zealand uh, practitioners, policy makers that are keen to contribute uh, to this regional digital twin strategy that we've been evolving, please uh, please join us. Head to digitaltwinweek.com. Uh, as I mentioned, registrations of interest open for Digital Twin Challenge. More information and when you go to the hub. Uh, and for our broader Smart Cities community, um, our awards program launched yesterday in just over two weeks. Round one submissions close. Uh, head to scwaustralia.com uh, to find out more information and download a submission guide there. Gavin, team, our guests, thank you so much. Uh, we're, we're done. Very insightful conversation. This recording will be available on the Hub this time tomorrow, and we look forward to talking again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Adam. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks all for getting up early and staying up. Later, so really appreciate it. So I hope you get a, a cup of tea and a 